Howard Dee, you're a US Democrat. Are you happy with the deal that has been done with Iran on the non-nuclear program? Well, look, I think it's the president's prerogative to figure out how to deal with Iran. Uh, I think they got a better deal than they should have. But I think it was worth trying the deal, and we're going to, you know, I teach a history class, and one of the things I teach the kids is you can't judge a president until 25 years after they've left office. This president is going to be judged on whether this was a success or a failure. You mentioned in your presentation that how, how to bring around change in Iran. Uh, you can do it through sanctions or you can do it by engagement. Which option do you think is best? Well, the president has tried engagement. I'm skeptical about engagement because I think the people who run Iran are really bad people. Uh, they're really very, very uh, authoritarian thugs, and they've murdered 2,500 of their own citizens in the last couple of years, usually in public hangings. Um, so, and there are also an enormous amount of corruption. So, uh, you know, these are big problems. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't engage, um, you can't even, uh, I, I look, for example, when I was running for president, we had at least somebody in our campaign who could talk to somebody inside all the other campaigns. Now, politics is a substitute for war, and president of the United States race is the closest thing to war that there is. It's not actually war. But you've got to talk to your people who are your enemies, because if you don't, uh, things get out of hand and a lot of people die. Europe is also involved in this agreement. What would you like to see happening with Europe in their relations with the Middle East more broadly, but it specifically with Iran? I think Europe is still unrealistic about the dangers that face them. They're still used to the uh, umbrella provided by American um, defense. I think they have a real problem with Putin, and I think they're split between people who think they can appease Putin, they should know better, uh, and the Eastern Europeans who have direct experience with, with the Russians. Uh, and I think they have a, a, a problem with Iran. Uh, again, it's the Western European countries that I worry more about. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think Brexit was so bad, it was not just uh, you know, disrupting the European Union, which is incredibly important. It's also that the United States and the UK have such a strong military arrangement. I think that the UK was injecting a, a sense of toughness into the European Union when, when, when it's sometimes lacking. One of the controversial issues in the Brexit debate was the fear that Europe was heading towards creating a European army. Is that something that you might even welcome? I think Europeans have to create a European army. The reason that you had such a terrible immigration problem is because you expected all the small border states like Greece to be able to cope with a million people coming across the border. That's unrealistic. We're a country of 310 million people. That's not as big as the European Union. If we had to rely on 50 different armies to keep out immigration, we'd have the same problems you would have, if not worse. So you're going to have to have at least a, Euro a unified uh, Europe uh, immigration uh, force to have uh, standards and support the small states that can't help themselves. Um, Bosnia never would have happened if there had been a united European ar army. Uh, it did happen. We had to step in. So I think you will see a united army, and you should see a united army. That doesn't mean individuals can't have uh, power. Each state in the United States has its own national guard, uh, and the governor can call them up if necessary. But it, 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 you can either be a small country, which Britain is about to become, or you can be a really big country and a huge player, which the EU is. Uh, and in order to do that, you're going to have to have a means of flexing uh, your power when soft power doesn't work. We're close to seeing the Democrat nominee. Now, we don't know whether it will be Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. We're assuming that it's Hillary Clinton. What would you say to, uh, to Hillary Clinton on what sh should happen in the Middle East in the future? Well, first of all, Hillary is enormously experienced, far more experienced than I am, so I wouldn't say and tell her what to do in the Middle East. But she, uh, unlike Donald Trump, actually knows something about foreign policy in the rest of the world. I have yet to meet anyone in any other country who uh, is not in favor of Hillary Clinton, not because they necessarily like her, but because they respect her, and that's in some ways more important. The Middle East is intractable, it's a very difficult situation. I was very supportive of her idea, which the President Obama didn't buy, which is to have a no-fly zone in Syria. I think if we had a no-fly zone two years ago when, before the Russians got in, uh, you wouldn't have a half a million Syrian refugees in Europe because they would have had a safe place to go, as the Kurds did when George H.W. Bush had a no-fly zone. So um, I, I'm not going to give Hillary Clinton public or probably even private advice about the Middle East because she knows a lot more about it than I do.